Hi, hello, good afternoon. I hope you can all see us well and hear us well. My name is Jan Nadek. I'm from the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation Geneva office, and I'm welcoming all of you today to our second webinar that we're having this summer with a wonderful guest. With me here on the couch is Stefan Liebig, a member of the German Bundestag from 2009 to 2021, and obviously currently a fellow of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. What we're trying to do in the next um, the hour or so is to have a conversation about the progressive America, the American state of the American left, um, especially ahead of the um, uh, midterm elections in the United States, um, where he has done some research for RLS and has just come just about to embark on his uh, second uh, three month research trip. But also, we want to have a conversation on the basis of his long and deep experience in the foreign policy field in Germany about what this current state of the left in the US and the current state of the US means for the international order, where we are the multi uh, with the multilateral system in general, is it in crisis, what comes next, and we want to have a little bit look because it's interesting for us here in the, the history of German policies towards Russia and how we end up this point. Um, but first, Stefan, welcome to uh, Geneva. It's nice to have you. You've just been, uh, since you left Parliament, you've been traveling up and down north, to east, coast to coast in the US. Give us a little bit of a, an idea what you think is the state of the progressive uh, America. Yeah, I would like to do it. Uh, thank you, Jan, for having me here in Geneva. Um, I must say I was surprised and I'm still very positive about the state of the progressive America because it is much, much better than ever after World War II. Because um, before that, the um, United States of America used to have a quite impressive uh, left um, uh, landscape. So let's look at the Socialist Party of America or even the Communist Party of America. They both have combined around 100,000 uh, members uh, in the 1930s and 40s of the last century. They were uh, important figures like Eugene V. Debs, Mother Jones, uh, Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King is mostly uh, known as a civil rights activist, but he was a socialist too. To just mm -hmm. give one quote of him, uh, the evils of capitalism are as real as the evils of militarism and the evils of racism. So there is a left history. After the Second World War, uh, it became worse. There was first uh, the McCarthyism. It was a wave of, um, of, of fear um, against communists. It was a Cold War. But to be honest, there was also uh, the secret speech by Khrushchev, which uh, brought up all the crimes uh, by Stalin. It was also the Realsozialismus, as we would call it, so the socialism that people could see in Eastern Europe. And obviously, it was not a good alternative for left Americans. So there was a decline in the progressive movement in the United States. But since, um, I would say, 2011, there's a huge turnaround. So because uh, with the movement Occupy Wall Street in 2011, the demonstrations in the Zuccotti Park in uh, New York City against the Wall Street, against uh, the actions of Obama after the finance uh, crisis. There was an uprising in the left movements. And one person is very important here. This is a sen senator of Vermont, Bernie Sanders. His uh, two campaigns in 2016 and 2020 in the primaries of the Democratic Party mm -hmm. to become their candidate that was so inspiring for so many people that we have now, I must say, a very strong and powerful left movement in the United States. The most important force here uh, are the Democratic Socialists of America, which is an old organization. Mm -hmm. It was founded in the 1960s, but it has changed its role and its, uh, its character. And it is now a 100,000 uh, member strong organization in all states in uh, the United States of America. They have members in the Congress, they have members in the state parliaments and on the municipality level. That is very impressive. Maybe uh, you know the squad um, led kind of by uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from uh, New York City. So there is a reason for hope. 
In the last years, we have seen a very strong Black Lives Matter movement after the terrible murder of George Floyd and also a Stop Asian Hate movement. So movements against racism are strong. There was a thing called a Strike Tober. So a strike movement, mm -hmm. um, a union organizing movement last year in October um, um, at the company Kellogg, um, there were um, one successful attempt to unionize an Amazon warehouse in New York State um, at Starbucks. Um, every Starbucks coffee shop where which is unionized will be celebrated online by progressives. That is a very important thing, John Deere. So good things happen. But unfortunately, not enough. We have still a terrible a culture war from the right. There is a terrible decision made by the conservative um, Supreme Court uh, regarding the abortion rights. So the women in America are no longer protected nationwide to get their right um, to have an abortion. There are terrible mass shootings and no, no real answer um, to this uh, made by the Congress. And uh, I must say, man, one of the most frightening things is that in this de facto two-party system, one of the two parties is uh, turning into a right-wing, a right-wing extremist a Trump sect, instead of being uh, just a conservative party. And so we have this increasing uh, force on the left, but we have a real threat to US democracy and um, this is a problem for us here in Europe too. Yeah, maybe just to, to follow up on that. Um, you described the progressive force as being stronger. You linked it to the financial crisis, which was an international event. Mm -hmm. And we're coming to a position where, from a perspective of us here in Geneva, and so we're seeing, and then we're seeing massive changes in the multilateral order. Mm -hmm. And the way you describe the, the left, you mentioned the struggle of Roe v. Wade and the overturning seems to be that it's a kind of an inward looking or progressive like, tries to change or defend rights in the US. But at the same time, what could be actually a productive or a role? What is the current role in the US multilateral order? Mm -hmm. And how could le left struggles um, have a positive impact in that? Or are these two separate? Mm -hmm. uh, areas because for us here in Geneva where we talk about what happens now with a rogue UN security member and for us it's very important to understand what progressive politics in the US might have an effect in the positioning of the of the US within the multilateral international system first I should explain that a lot of people in the US and political parties and also unfortunately left movements are very inward looking. So it is, there was always a struggle between an isolationist United States of America and a country which uh, tries to organize the whole world sometimes in a bad way. And um, we have here a back and forth. After the terrible years uh, with Donald Trump as a uh, president, we have a few tiny steps in the good direction. So it was important and good that the United States decided to go to be part of the uh, Paris uh, Climate Treaty um, again. That was good. Also, I think it was good that uh, the US started to uh, renegotiate the Iran uh, nuclear agreement. It is a controversial topic, I know, but uh, being a longtime member of the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee in the German Bundestag, I know how hard it was to came as far and nothing uh, got better after the United States has left it, have left it. So I think those are good steps. Um, I also think it was uh, the right decision to end the invasion of Afghanistan. Of course, the situation there is terrible and how it ended was terrible too. But this very, very long war was not a helpful idea. So I think it was good that Joe Biden made this decision. But there are bad sides too. So if you look at the um, confrontation between the United States and the People's Republic of China, um, there's still the same confrontation, um, the visit uh, made by Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan, which I think was a mistake and it was even criticized within the administration, mm -hmm. was not helpful. Um, 
we have an increasing, uh, huge, incredible increasing in military spending, and that doesn't make sense in the world we are living right now. And I think those are threats to uh, the future. But the question is, what will happen to the system of a multilateral order? And um, I think we need the United Nations organization, and we need uh, this whole system. And here I want to quote uh, Willy Brandt, mm -hmm. because in 1973, when uh, the two Germanys became a member of the United Nations, he gave a very good speech there. And there was one sentence, sentence I really liked. It, it is, some criticism of the United Nations sounds bitter, cynical, is of almost, almost jubilant pessimism, as if one secretly hopes that the weakness of the organization disprove the idea and goal, but setbacks on the way to an ideal do not necessarily prove that the ideal is wrong, but often only that the way could be better. And that mm -hmm. is exactly what I think and what I would hope leftists should fight for. Mm -hmm. There are good reasons to criticize uh, the United Nations, but not to have them nothing would be better. So I think we should fight for improve it. Um, as, left, as leftists, we should always point out double standards, even in difficult times right now. Mm -hmm. And it is not an excuse to say this in advance to the actions by the mm -hmm. Russian government or military. But we have to mention that it was Ronald Reagan who said after the uh, United Nations General Assembly, um, voted 108 to 9 to condemn the U.S. invasion of Grenada, that it would, uh, it didn't even upset his breakfast. That was his mm -hmm. look to the United Nations. And we had the same uh, disregard for international law shown by um, Herbert Walker uh, Bush regarding Panama, Bill Clinton regarding Kosovo, George W. Bush regarding Iraq and Afghanistan, and Barack Obama, if we look at the drone wars in Libya. Libya. And when um, Russia now is or used to have invaded Afghanistan or is now invading Ukraine against international law, or China is ignoring international law in the South China Sea, the US is blaming them. I think we as leftists shouldn't take sides mm. and blame one more and one less. That's my opinion. I mean, we can obviously always take the side uh, of the people. I would, mm -hmm. before we come to the UN system, take one step back because yeah. from the first topic, and let me also just mention that if you have a question, you can put it into the Q&A version of this webinar and we come uh, back at the end. I just have a few questions prepared. But the way you describe the democratic soldiers of, of America, you describe basically the US as two different party systems. You have a, the, the Republicans, which turn into a monolithic or the more and more far right or right wing party in line with maybe Fidesz uh, or Peace uh, in Poland and Hungary. But you describe the um, basically the Democrats, the way I am, as a form of coalition mm -hmm. of different forces. Um, how does it work? Like, what is the role of a, a left or democratic socialist in such a coalition? Mm. Um, that is basically within one party. That it seems mm. to me a big systemic difference. And how might this affect international politics? It is really difficult. So let me start with the famous quote by uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. She mentioned before. Uh, uh, Joe Biden was nominated as the president of the Democratic Party, that in no un other country on earth she would be in the same party uh, with Joe Biden. And mm -hmm. uh, that is maybe true, because the Democrats are not like a social democratic party. It is a party, if I would compare it with the German system, which would include uh, parts of CDU, CSU, FDP, the Green Party, the Social Democratic Party, and the Left Party. And so you can see how broad this party mm -hmm. is. And I mentioned... Um, how successful the progressive forces were. And one result is that um, nearly half of the members of the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives are part of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. That sounds a lot, and it is a lot. 
And the Democrats uh, have the majority in the House. They have uh, the 50-50 plus one majority uh, in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And they have the White House. So the question is, uh, why is not happening more? And uh, Joe Biden uh, made a lot of good promises. And he even in his first speech uh, pictured, an, uh, I would say, kind of social democratic America. Why is it not, not happening? Because uh, in this big tent, some would say the centrists, I would say the right wing of the party, um, they are blocking it. There are two senators in the Senate, uh, Kirsten Sinema from Arizona and Joe Manchin from West Virginia, who uh, voted opposing the, um, all the proposals, the good proposals made by Joe Biden. And uh, this is terrible and not helpful. And sometimes I've met um, leftists in the US who looked a little bit jealous to a proportional system like we have it in Germany. And they would say, yeah, you are so lucky. You have your own left party. You don't have to uh, find these terrible compromises. Um, but I had to tell them, first of all, we have fights and have to find compromises even within this uh, small left party in Germany. And also the Social Democrats and the Green in Germany, they have the option to form coalitions with the people from the other tent, like the CDU or the FDP. Mm -hmm. And they do it, as we know. So I'm not sure which system is better. So, But answering your question, it is complicated and all depends on how many progressive um, people were elected into the Congress, in the Senate, on the state parliaments, and on the municipality level, because the Democratic Party is not a party like we have parties in Germany. It's like an election-based coalition of very different forces. And as more left-wing um, people are elected into offices, as uh, more left uh, the party itself would become. Well, that's interesting. I mean, one of the things that um, I'm not being an expert on the United States, just this uh, the same idea that it's as broad as a country as the European Union is. And probably Alaska and Mississippi are as different as Estonia and Portugal, mm. with the difference that they have an agreed political system. It seems to be that the constitutional arrangement is no longer working that very well. And there seems to be a degree of polarization and political extremism that has can even have some violent outbursts. There was an article, I think, in the Washington Post. It's actually an opportunity for a civil war. Like, do you see a danger of political violence? Though there's obviously always, let's reflect on ourselves, this European arrogance in our whole perspective of American declinism that can work out and then I think no one has ever won a bet betting against the United States in a while, and I certainly wouldn't. But it seems to be that in the US and in the US, le US left, especially with the discussion of the Second Amendment, there is a whole there, a strong debate on internal political violence being escalating. Is it a real factor? Has it figured in your conversation? We do have a real threat uh, against US democracy. And yes, uh, there is already violence. If we look at the January 6th mm -hmm. storm uh, at the Capitol, at the uh, parliament, uh, it's cited by the former president. Mar-a-Lago. Against uh, people who are working for the FBI. And yes, this polarization, uh, you can see it between the states but it is no longer a civil war like uh, the uh, old one that used to happen because it's not north against south. But you have states who are much more progressive and you have states who are much more conservative. And nobody knows if we will have these United States of America in the future. So I think a lot is uh, depending on the midterm elections. Mm -hmm. So um, if the Republicans would win, and that wasn't be most of the midterm elections are against the party of the acting president, mm -hmm. um, so it could happen. Uh, then it would be nearly impossible for Joe Biden to fulfill his promises until the end of his term. And so, so we know we don't know who will run as a Republican candidate, but uh, Donald Trump is, is still in the game. So it could happen that he is back into power or someone like him. And uh, 
these Republicans are no longer accepting um, the norms of a democracy, like accepting election results mm -hmm. or something. And so there is a real threat. On the other hand, um, we can see some polls right now that it's maybe possible that some more Senate seats could be won by uh, Democrats. Uh, they could uh, go on with their uh, majority in the House of Representatives, and maybe then the blockade by these two senators I've mentioned could be overcome, and then he could fulfill his promises, and the people could see that he would really deliver a question of um, cancelling the student loan debt or increasing the minimum wage or having um, lower taxes for families and having a, a better coverage by health insurances. All these things are possible if they have a, demo, a majority by the Democrats and they really can use it. Having been in parliament yourself for so long, mm. would you have enjoyed to have the power of a filibuster in Germany, <laughs> being allowed to speak as long as you want just to have a veto <laughs> power on some sort of legislation? I'm kind of impressed uh, how people can do it, standing there talking for hours sometimes about nonsense just to block things. But to be to be to be serious, the filibuster in the end um, means that in the Senate it is not enough to have a majority of mm. 50 plus one vote, which the Democrats already have. You need 60 votes to start a debate, and this is really weird because. Um, if you have a majority, why can't you make a decision with the majority? And there were a lot of debates um, about um, getting rid of this uh, strange old system because it comes from a time when these two parties, not or oh, the senators didn't really vote um, within their party lines. Mm -hmm. So then it was like, we need a lot of people to agree on something, but the Republicans blocking everything. And so if there was a question, the United States of America, they go, don't have a national law for giving the right of having an abortion to uh, mm -hmm. all citizens in the country. And uh, they could just decide about this law because they have a majority, but they have to get rid of the filibuster before. And so I think it is a weird and old fashioned system. Uh, the United States used to be one of the first democracies and um, that was good. But some of the things they did then should be modernized, but that seems to be very unlikely right now. Yeah, there's a, a question that stuck in my hand, and I'm going to come back to the international order now, is, is this actually, I mean, the United States has gone to many different historical phases. The Constitution is very old in its original text. It still counts Black Americans only as three-fifths of a well, it's very complicated, but they have gone through transformation. The filibuster is really is new, but the key question is: Are we again at some kind of conjuncture where there is an internal transformation? Meaning, um, we saw the founding era and the nation state after the Civil War. We saw the Progressive era, then the New Deal era, now the neoliberal era. So is there something new coming up now? And all the thing we talk about, Philip, was just a discussion about whether it's actually a procedural reflection of an underlying transformation to a new form of United States that's either more democratic socialist mm -hmm. or more authoritarian yeah. fascist. Is that the, the struggle that we're actually seeing? I think so. So uh, in which direction it will, it will go it is open. But the United States uh, of America in 2022, they are moving in two opposite directions. So the Democratic Party is no longer the party of Obama and Clinton. Um, Joe Biden gave a speech in mm -hmm. the Congress that uh, trickle down economics has never worked. This was unheard of. That is a good thing. So the, the Democratic Party, uh, it looks like they are moving into a social democratic direction, mm -hmm. which is not enough, but good. But the Republican Party right now can change too, but the Republican Party right now is just a right wing, I must say, extremist Trump sect. And this is terrible. And so it depends in which direction uh, the 
the uh, development will go. And it is not just a question which is a problem for the people on the other side of the ocean. It is a question for us too, because the United States of America in a good or in a bad way are very influential globally. And um, if we look at the war of Russia against Ukraine and his outcomes, if we now for good reasons don't want to be dependent on Russian energy anymore, and then we will be dependent on United States LNG gas, for instance. And the United States are no longer a democratic country. We would come from one mess to another mess. So it is uh, important for us too. I think that leads me to my uh, the next area that I wanted to discuss with you on that. And now also building on your long experience in international uh, relation there. Um, but it's important, the United States and others builds a post-war order and like a classical left perspective would say, okay, this is all a cover up for imperialist strategy. Mm. But in reality, there is a multilateral and international system with institutions, with processes that are designed to take care of many needs people in the global South have that we deem as relevant from the global climate negotiations, the question of global health, there are these international conventions on human rights. These are all actually hallmarks of progressive legislation, civilization that are underwritten by international order in which all great uh, states or central powers support this in principle mm -hmm. as represented in the UN General Assembly and the UN Se Security Council. So now we are here in Geneva, meaning all of us here know that we have the ruins and the remnants of one failed international order on the shores of Lac Le Mans, which is the League of Nations. Now the UN system and all the processes here is rattled um, by Russia's war. And you mentioned obviously also other like precursors of that, but like the school war, land war of aggression is I think without example um, for UN and security council member maybe China's war against Vietnam and in, in India count a little bit in that aspect, but this is this is very problematic. So where do you see this international order going? Where do you see the UN system surviving? And where do you see potential forms it can come out of the current situation? First of all, um, international law was always threatened by powerful members of the United Nations Security Council who thought they could do it. So one famous example is Colin Powell sitting sitting in the mm -hmm. United Nations Security Council, showing up some things and trying to prove, which was obviously a lie, that Iraq and Saddam Hussein would have uh, weapons of mass destruction, which was a lie. And a terrible war started with uh, 100,000 uh, of uh, victims, and uh, that was terrible. Um, if you talk about our Europe soil, uh, the Wars in in uh, the former Yugoslavia were, were terrible, and some actions made by the United States, and we can discuss if they were good or bad discuss, uh, actions, but what we have to acknowledge is they were actions without, um, uh, without asking the United Nations Security Council, and so it was against international law too. And um, this is a problem because Vladimir Putin was uh, smart enough when he asked uh, the Federal Council in Russia for sending troops into Eastern Ukraine, and not mm. the, the ones we have right now in the beginning of the crisis, he was saying there are Russians uh, threatened in Ukraine and that's why you have to do it. And that was exact, the exact uh, reason Ronald Reagan gave for his invasion of Grenada. Why do I say it? I think uh, what we as leftists shouldn't do is to say to say they are only the ones. But now we have this war here in Europe, and I want to talk about this too. Nothing of the things I've mentioned before are should be seen as an excuse. There is no excuse for this terrible war, for this terrible invasion. And um, now to say, look, this is a proof why we don't need the UN anymore would be the total uh, wrong outcome, I think. There was even a tiny, tiny baby step in the right direction. Um, the uh, I think it was Liechtenstein 
Liechtenstein gave a, a proposal to the United Nations um, General Assembly to, um, to um, have in the future a rule that if one veto power is uh, giving a veto to a decision, then there has to be a meeting of the General Assembly and this veto power, this one of the P5 members mm -hmm. have to explain why they are doing it. It looks like a tiny step and it looks like a step um, targeted against Russia, but this is actually a good thing because in the future, if for some reason, uh, let's say France or the United Kingdom or maybe the United States of America uh, uh, having a veto against something, then we could use this new rule too. And I think this is good. So we need a strong international system and we shouldn't give it up, even in terrible moments uh, we have right now. It would be a bit of an irony if the step towards democratization from the UN would come from the Grand Duchy of Liechtenstein, <laughs> the last two <laughs> absolute monarchy, monarchy <laughs> in Europe. So I don't know who played it through then, but it's a bit of a funny game. But let me let, let me just get one thing clear yeah. in coming towards the question of Germany and Russia and yeah. relations. We on the left have criticized the war in Iraq and the others. We have not criticized as much Russia's intervention in Syria mm. than we did with the US intervention in Iraq. Some there seems to be this and I feel this necessary relativism mm. of us that we always have to go to all the examples of Western and NATO and European intervention before we then came to our primary part of discussion. And it might have something to do with our identity, with our history, but maybe it's also something to do with our blind spots. Mm. Um, and I'd like to ask you maybe to comment on the broader perspective there. You were a member of the foreign, po the foreign policy committee of the Bundestag, I think from 2009 to 2019, 20, oh, yeah, 20. roughly mm -hmm. one year before you left Parliament. Yeah. That is the time of the first Russian invasion mm -hmm. in, of the Maidan, the first Russian invasion of Crimea, the establishment of the People's Republic of Donetsk. It's all of the time in which Minsk I and II is negotiated, and there's this whole debate about how Germany should engage the East. It's linked to the question of Nord Stream 2, our Eastern European neighbors commenting us. And beyond the question of the left, how did the Fed from your perspective, in terms of the strategic debates, how did you think we, the German Federal Republic of Germany ended up in a position as weak and as complicated as it is now, with our Eastern European neighbors not trusting us, no gas coming through Nord Stream 1 or 2, and full energy dependency? From an outside perspective, it looks, was there no strategic thinking mm -hmm that maybe we might not have a strategy, but did everyone assume that no one else might have a strategic policy in terms of gas? Mm -hmm. Basically, to cut it short, since the microphone, how did that cluster fuck happen? <laughs> yeah, um, I will come to this. Um, and we, we as leftists made mistakes, Germany made mistakes to be very clear. But before I come to these mistakes, I, I have to go back to uh, the history because everything is uh, connected to history. As we all know, uh, Germany started uh, two world wars and especially the terrible uh, second world war has to be mentioned here. So 24 uh, million citizens of the USSR uh, have died in this terrible war, were killed there. And it was, and I have to say, it still is an obligation for Germany, for German politics to try to have as good relations with the successor states, all of them, of the former USSR right now. So that means um, Poland, that means Ukraine, that means Belarus, that means uh, Russia too, as complicated as it is. And so I think uh, the sometimes now we have a feeling of everything was wrong from the beginning on. And it's easy to say in this terrible moments, if you see the war crimes of the Russian army in Ukraine, 
But I think it's too easy to say it was always wrong. I think uh, Willy Brandt's Entspannungspolitik uh, policy of deterrent. I'm not Ost sure. Politik. Yeah, Ost Ost Politik. Politik. Yeah, sure. yeah. Uh, was a good thing. And I have to mention too, the GDR where I was born and I grew up was part of the Eastern Bloc. We didn't have so much choices how to make politics there. And so in the GDR, there was an oil pipeline built in the 60s. It was called Drushpa, meaning friendship. It was the largest uh, oil pipeline in the world then. And with this oil pipeline, the whole GDR, and also to mention this whole West Berlin, uh, got their oil from. So it, it was in those times, I think, not a bad thing. And then when West, when Je West Germany decided in the Cold War to have their gas pipelines, um, I think that wasn't a bad thing either. Um, but there were mistakes. I mentioned this because sometimes people are asking me, why are you so stupid to connect you to Russia? There is this history. So a part of the German de de dependency comes from the GDR, mm -hmm. not all of it. Uh, but there were mistakes made too. Um, I think, especially after the end of the Cold War, uh, there was this idea of um, now we would have um, a common security here in Europe. The Warsaw Treaty, which was a military alliance of the Soviet bloc, was disassembled. And there was uh, this window of opportunity. There was uh, um, a Paris uh, conference of the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, in December 1990, where they talked about having, in the future, organized the security in Europe together. It didn't happen. The opportunity was missed. The NATO got new members. And I have to add, I understand the East European countries that they decided to be a member of the NATO regarding their history with the Soviet Union, with uh, Russia before. So um, and then even there were proposals, requests, ma requests made by Yeltsin, by Putin one, and by Medvedev to then have maybe Russia as a member of the NATO. And then there was a proposal of having a security treaty for Europe. Everything was ignored. I don't know if uh, we would have gone in a different way if we could have avoided situations we are in right now. I don't know it. But I have to mention that, in my opinion, it was a missed opportunity. Meanwhile, Russia has fought a terrible war within its, war its borders. Um, I have to mention the terrible war in Chechnya. Mm. A lot of people in Europe uh, didn't... They, they tried not to see it because it was within Russia's borders, but it was still a terrible, a terrible war. And now we come to the situation you mentioned before, Crimea. Um, after the incorporation of Crimea into Russian territory in violation of international law, uh, and after Russians' military action, badly covered military actions in eastern Ukraine, it was... Uh, it was the Merkel government who tried to find a negotiation solution. And that was one of the two options. I remember the time when we sat in the Committee of Foreign Affairs and when we talked to our counterparts in the US Congress. And there was a wing in the US Congress who was promoting the idea to increase uh, military spending to uh, support Ukraine and get back this, these areas uh, by military force. But then Obama and Merkel agreed that they tried to negotiate something. And the Minsk agreement was negotiated also by President Poroshenko, who signed it as the Ukrainian president then. From, if we look back now, of course, we see maybe it has never had the chance of a success. But I think still it was worth a try. But now I come to the mistakes. Obviously, it was a mistake to ignore the wishes uh, by the Eastern European states to stop the Nord Stream 2 project. And I have to admit that I now think it was a mistake of my party um, uh, not to uh, support these calls for ending it, but instead uh, supporting this project until the last minutes and some people even after the last minutes. And I think that was a big mistake. I think we should have been much, much stronger in, in our statements regarding Crimea, Eastern Ukraine, because you are right, 
it always uh, sounds bad if you are very loud and powerful if it comes to one war and very um, uh, quiet if it, if it comes to another war and this happens it happens at the on the government side too but since we are not in the government since we are an opposition party we should be free to have one measurement and no double standards and we didn't even uh, made this also we had I think another mistake is that we uh, listened not carefully enough to our friends, to our left friends, to our progressive friends in Ukraine or in Russia, those who are criticizing Putin or in Eastern Europe. That was a problem. And um, I think um, we have to learn from it. From it. So um, no relativization anymore, uh, being very clear, no double standards. I think this is what we have to do. And I hope leftists all over the world will do it because the biggest mistake is still to map the world uh, through the lenses of the cold war from the last century yeah i mean a great ukrainian left uh, wrote a wonderful article where they've talked about the anti-imperialism of the idiots mm. meaning the idea that it was only one form of imperialism mm. and we had this escape debate with the african left Mm -hmm. okay in the end somehow putin is the only one who stands up against western mm -hmm. imperialism mm -hmm. and then no one really can explain how russia borders japan mm -hmm. because it's obviously also has an imperial part and is an imperialist project i recently had a conversation with someone relevant from the left that ah we can't call putin a fascist because that would mean we as anti-fascists would have to violently mm -hmm. uh oppose him so there is a catch-22 the where the left seems to be stuck in a form of um despite all the criticism a form of anti-americanism that has blinded us and and to see actually the agency of central and eastern european states mm. because i do believe there is a from a german perspective from a historian's perspective there is this weird tradition in germany that somehow everything between berlin and Moscow, the countries there, they don't really matter. That is discussed between bigger powers. And Putin plays to it when he says, um, I, th when, I think when he says, ah, we discuss this with the US, everyone else has no agency mm. uh, in this. And I think we might have fallen as progressives into this trap, but, um, in, but also I'm giving you a chance to to respond to that, um, what was, and I think I'm picking up there on a question that we got from the audience, what was the American left reaction mm -hmm. to Russia's mm -hmm. war of uh, revisionist policy and war of aggression? Is there a specific one? Yeah, um, I was very surprised and positively surprised uh, by the US American reactions. First of all, a lot of former Soviet citizens, Russians, Ukrainians, uh, whatever, living in the United States. So I was part of a demonstration in Brighton Beach in uh, New York City. Um, it's called Little Odessa. And there were uh, signs mm -hmm. like um, Russians against war. And I've met a person who has organized uh, um, uh, a help uh, delegation sent to Poland to the border to help the refugees there. So there's a much, uh, there's a lot of solidarity within uh, the former Soviet, now US society. I've never found anyone who was uh, supporting Putin's war. If it comes to the left, I was positively surprised that in a moment when in Germany, some leftists still were saying, why would Russia ever invade Ukraine? Bernie Sanders gave a speech on the Senate floor of course, mentioning uh, the mistakes the NATO has made and the US has made, and also the wars uh, the US did against international law. But he was very clear in one point. If there would be a war against Ukraine, then there's one person responsible. This is Vladimir Putin. And he, as a, the left um, politician in the United States, would support, and later he did, sanctions against uh, the Russian government. And when it, came to when it came to decision regarding military aid, regarding the membership of Finland and Sweden uh, in the NATO, the only no, way, no votes came from the right 
right-wing Republicans mm -hmm. voted no. All Democrats, including the squad, the progressives, AOC, Bernie Sanders, you name them, they were very clear. And um, I think that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is a big thing. Of course, among the leftists, it's a broad spectrum, not all of them are obviously in the Congress, there are different positions too, and you would find these stupid anti-imperialists in, in the United States too. But um, I think on the uh, elected side of these leftists, it was a very clear and surprisingly a good decision. Yeah, maybe. So that's, that sounds different from the European left, which is a little bit, mm. to be honest. Our own, the left itself has different factions. And there seems to be this fascination of the authoritarian, mm. like the leader, the strong guy, the person that stands up instead of actually collective action or progressive organi organizing. So I was always wondering, like when all these, when all the, some people were publishing statements, Russia will never cause a war. Obviously it did. Not successfully, because I can share from perspective of someone who's worked in Africa, that corrupt extractivist dictatorships never produce effective military. Mm. So for me, Putin is a bit of a mixture of Robert Mugabe and Paul Kagame with a bit of a more on the failing side. And obviously his military uh, fell apart as soon as they, they hit real opposition. So let's see. But we're in for a long-term conflict there. So uh, apparently winter is coming. What can we learn though from that? not just in terms of the overall strategic approach you said it we have to be we should not have double standards but what can we actually learn because so many of us or so many left got so much wrong what can be the preconditions of learning that we need to set to re-establish ourselves as a as a contributor to productive debate there what can the left learn i think one thing and there's a little bit to go on this path, could be to accept that we as leftists don't do geopolitics here. So I mentioned mm -hmm. what the United States and China did wrong and what Russia did uh, wrong. And the question is, why are we putting ourselves as leftists in the shoes of a state? We are not the exile government of the German Democratic Republic. So we have to we have we have to look at the people there, at individual peoples. And if we do this, we are against warmongers everywhere. Mm -hmm. If they are from the Pentagon or from the Chinese People Liberations Army or from the Russian military, we are on the opposite side of them. We are not on the side of oligarchs. We are against oligarchs in the United States, in Ukraine, and in Russia. So mm -hmm. why would we try to act like a state here? I, I don't understand this. Um, I'm against it. That would be a very important point. And I have to say it again, um, this question of double standards. To give one example, if we are as leftists against the death penalty, then we should it in the same strong way in China, in the United States, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, in Vietnam, in Japan. And you can understand why I mentioned these mm. states, because on every of these states, you can, you can imagine where we are a little bit louder and where we are a little bit more silent. This is wrong. This is not our position. And I'm still positive and optimistic because I think in a way it is um, a generational conflict too. I see uh, a lot of um, leftists who come from the time of the Cold War and they cannot accept that uh, some of the things they always believe in are obviously uh, wrong. So uh, the younger people don't have this problem. So when Putin came into power and started his actions against queer people in Russia, mm -hmm. the young members of the left party never understood why we should defend this person. So because they didn't grow up in the GDR and have some uh, German Soviet uh, friendship past. So I think we should, um, and this looking through lenses mm. of the Cold War. No double standards, don't do politics and look more at the individuals and then decide what to do. 
That brings me to a question we have from our our audience um, about um, because you talk about generational change. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden is going to turn 80 soon. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders is in his 80s. So is um, Nancy Pelosi. So there seems to be a big age difference. So what do you think is there can you see any trends like where will the next the next generation of left and right um in the u.s where for example, the progressive side looks back at progressive america where will how does the next generation of left look like what will it be like what is the perspective it is true if we look at the most famous leftist, which is uh, Bernie Sanders, but in general, I would say on the progressive side, it is a much more a younger movement. We can look at the results of the primaries uh, right now, and there are some very interesting people who may come in the next Congress, like uh, Summer Lee from Pennsylvania, Greg Casa from uh, Texas. And I see on the municipality, on the state level, much, much more of them. So I have, mm -hmm. I have hope um, regarding this. Um, there is, if I mentioned the Democratic Socialist of America as the now biggest organization, the old DSA was like these nice social democratic uh, white old men organization. The new DSA is a very heterogenic, a very, um, very young, very diverse organization. So I see a lot of changes there, and also the demographic of the United States of America is changing. You can, I know some Republicans try to protect the good old quotation mark, uh, white America, but it is not possible. The majority um, of the country is changing and will changing, and I think this is not a bad thing. In, in Europe, the classic left is defined by social democratic and socialist parties, and trade unions, and then there were also social movements, but they kind of ended up with the Greens. Mm. In the United States, you describe the uh, the, the, Demo the, the Democrats as a coalition, and then there's a strong focus on social movements and civil rights movements. Where are the unions? Um, the unions are differently organized uh, than in uh, Germany. But they are there and they are becoming uh, stronger. There were, were these uh, strikes I mentioned before, and uh, the unions are from time to time are working together with uh, leftists. There's right now an interesting tour uh, made by uh, some uh, union team stars, by uh, Sarah Nelson from the flight attendant union, by Bernie mm -hmm. Sanders, too. That really gives hope seeing people. From a socialist party talking to real workers and not only about them and working together with them mm -hmm. so there is a movement but within the um, u.s um, unions a lot of change is necessary too well, there seems to be but i would like to come a little back now to the social movements here mm -hmm. one of the things that russia's war against ukraine and the transition from russia to a internally authoritarian to an external active, actually fascist, revisionist dictatorship, is that all of these countries and this energy that's needed is actually needed to tackle climate change. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we discuss about this, there's going to be core process and we are in the midst of a climate emergency and not just the climate crisis, it is global emergency. So two questions just to sum things up. First, what role, like in Europe, the Friday for Future movement is a very strong social movement uh, that's influencing progressive politics. What role does the climate, is there an anti-climate movement similar to that in the US and which role does it do in progressive politics? And second, um, let's send your last guess that we would like to get Will we keep these kind of holistic global negotiations or will it just be clubs of the willing and the plurilateral system so that we somehow make advances for those? And if yes, what would be the role of a progressive United States or progressive forces in this? 
Okay, first of all, there is a strong uh, climate movement within the United States. It is different than our Fridays for Future. They don't know so much about Fridays for Future, but they have um, a lot of food, a lot of actions. There's a sunrise movement with which is an, a huge organization which influenced uh, the politics of the Democrats too. Um, there was this proposal uh, made by AOC for a Green New Deal. And right now there is actually a new law made by Joe Biden uh, with his a thin majority. It's called Inflation Reduction Act. And one part of this Inflation Reduction Act, which should be much bigger, but still one part is uh, the biggest climate investment in the history of the United States. So things are happening and they are influenced by the movement. And this is a good thing. If we come to the global level, I think there was one thing in the past with, which was actually good from my point of view. It was called peaceful coexistence. It was a description in Europe made between the socialist and the capitalist states in the uh, KSZA, CSCE, a conference of social and security cooperation in Europe, um, the Helsinki process. And the idea was not that we have to like the system of the other country, but we have to exist without having wars with each other. Of course, I would like to have a world without dictatorships and without authoritarian states. Mm -hmm. But obviously the attempt of the West to try to achieve this goal with military and wars was not helpful. I would say in the result, it was the opposite. So as long as we have these authoritarian states, this the dictatorships, uh, this monarchies, we even have to work with them to give a co comprehensive answer to the uh, to the climate change. So we have to work together with them. So what I would like to have is a world where you have international organizations, international law accepted by everyone, but working together in cases who are a threat for all of us. So and then to win as a democratic part of the world, we just have to be better. So we have to show that the people have a better life in a capitalist country, which is not the case right now because of the big because of, of the neoliberal age. So we have to uh, do something for increase the living standards of the people who are living in mm. democratic countries. And then maybe that would be a good example for people who are living in other states too. That is the way I would like to work for. If this is not work, or in addition, we should uh, have a situation where those countries who are willing and able to work together, together, they should just do it. We shouldn't ban them or forbid them to do it. But of course, it would be, be better to have international binding treaties um, for all of us. It would mean we mean social redistribution, inclusive ecological change, and military deterrence. Yeah, it means because that was what's underwriting the case. I think the yeah, the question, the question, okay, it would be a world where we accept that we don't have to deter each other, where we have ex where we accept borders and international law because we understand it is good for all of us. And to be honest, um, I think of a lot of people would say the Cold War didn't break out uh, because of the nuclear weapons. I don't believe in it. Mm. I think the Cold War didn't break out, out because the countries understood that it would cost more than it would bring and it's not helpful to do it. And I think such a world would be good. And every country look after the pandemic. Every country, every government had so much to do within their borders. Why would they waste money for trying to occupy other territories? Yeah, we actually don't have time for that. So. <laughs> Okay, with this, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. I would like to Stefan, thank you for coming to thank Geneva for, for us. Um, we will post this recording on our website or social media channels and feel free to engage with us on rosalox uh, Geneva.org. And um, yeah, we hope to welcome you again for one of our next seminars. And with this, thank you and goodbye and we wish you a wonderful afternoon. Bye.